Welcome to Dominican University of California. My name is Laura Stivers, and I'm the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts and Education. We're pleased to be the host sponsor for this inaugural TEDx Marin Salon. Our topic tonight, why men and boys behave the way they do, is timely considering the increasing number of mass shootings. We have all watched in horror over several recent events, especially the Parkland school shooting, but also the Vegas shooting closer to home that took a fellow Novato swim team parent and friend of mine. As a trained ethicist, I'm aware that social problems are complex and have multiple causes. While we know that a society with so many guns, so much media and video game violence, and increasing poverty and inequality is bound to have negative effects, we also see that it's most often men, not women, who are doing the mass shootings. I look forward to hearing tonight why this is the case and how we might nurture young men differently how we can avoid teaching and modeling for men a toxic masculinity and instead support their emotional well-being and ability to care. Tonight's talks will be moderated by Barbara Nemco, Napa County Superintendent of Schools since 1997. She has a doctorate from UC Berkeley and has been in education for a number of years. She is passionate about the potential for technology to revolutionize education and has won several state and national awards for her advocacy in this area. Working with five school districts and over 20,000 school kids, she is, like me, also interested in youth development. Please welcome Dr. Nemco. Well, welcome. It's wonderful to see so many people here. On behalf of TEDx Marin, we want to thank you for coming. This is the first of three TEDx salons. These salons go deep into one topic at each event. Tonight, you know we're talking about the boy crisis. On May 10th, right here, TEDx Marin will present its second salon on the latest research into extending our human health span. So a TEDx salon is different than a TEDx talk. This is how it works. Each of our three featured speakers will make a 12 to 15 minute presentation. Then we will all assemble center stage for our Q&A segment. And before we forget, I know you heard it once, but check your cell phone again. You don't want to be that person. <laughs> Many questions have been submitted in advance. And so they will be primarily coming from uh, Tim in the sound booth. And just a couple of thank yous. TEDx Marin would specifically like to thank Mozilla, Fairview Capital, Audi of Marin, Compass, and BioMarin for their support of the 2018 Salon Series. And last but not least, we really want to thank Dominican University for making us feel so welcome here. So the topic of the boy crisis, I think, is probably the most under-the-radar topic there is today, except when there's a mass shooting. And so what we need to do to make sure that this does not continue is what we're going to learn tonight. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Warren Farrell, co-author of The Boy Crisis, the only man ever elected three times to the board of the National Organization for Women in New York City. He was chosen by the Financial Times of London as one of the world's top 100 thought leaders. His first bestseller was Why Men Are the Way They Are, and his just-released book is The Boy Crisis, co-authored with John Gray. Now, Warren is an academic, which you'll hear as he tells you about his research, and only an academic could have a one-hour conversation at a party with John Lennon and have no idea who he was. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Dr. Warren Farrell. Royce Mann was 14. He produced a video that went viral because it expressed in words what so many boys feel. I'd like to share a portion of that with you. Recently, I became a man. 
It happened the first time a woman avoided me on the sidewalk. She glanced back and changed direction, crossing the street. Her footsteps taught me the danger of my own hands. In that moment, I finally understood Peter Pan. I want to stay a boy, not become a man, because a man, as I now know, is a mix between a father, brother, and attacker, mostly the latter. Feel Royce's shame, the danger of my own hands, at his male identity being mostly an attacker, at his conclusion, I want to stay a boy. In no part of Royce's entire poem did he discuss the positive aspects of masculinity. For example, the sacrifices fathers learned as part of their male role to die in war so their families wouldn't have to live under Nazi rule, or to mine coal so their children wouldn't have to mine coal. It is a rare junior high school teacher today that teaches your son that millions of moms made sacrifices of careers and millions of dads made sacrifices in careers. Often earning money that someone else spent while his dad died sooner. In school, he doesn't seem to learn anymore that both parents made sacrifices so their children would have a better life than they have. Instead, the most common word boys today associate with masculinity is the word toxic. And the emotion that emanates from toxic is, of course, shame. Everyday life reinforces this for boys like Royce. It is, after all, boys and men who are doing the mass shootings at almost once a week. Hashtag me, uh, hashtag me too makes a mask. If there's no man I can trust, can I trust myself? For boys like Royce, hashtag me too is the latest iteration of a half century of holding up our binoculars to the female experience of, of powerlessness, to the female experience of powerlessness and the female experience of male power. No one has suggested that we also hold up our binoculars to the male experience of powerlessness and the male experience of female power. Hmm, I noticed a little something in the audience. He's saying, what is the male experience of female power? You may have heard it as a son, your son may have said sometime to you, Kristen is so beautiful. She would never go out with me. I'm not even on the football team. But your son would never put it this way. Mom and Dad, this is an example of my experience of my powerlessness and, my, and, the, female, and the male experience of female power. You see, I feel I have to buy her drinks and dinner just to make myself worthy of her. Royce's video went viral because the cultural zeitgeist is that boys' opinions are not valid because boys have male privilege. That they are part of the patriarchy that has made rules to benefit men at the expense of women. Now it is women's turn to speak up, men's turn to shut up. Any expression of his feelings is called mansplaining. Ask your male Uber driver, if he believes that he's working 65 hours per week because he has male privilege or male power. He intuitively understands that the road to high pay is a toll road and that his role to earn more to support his family is an expectation. You're the dad, you pay those tolls. But he would never say, the expectation I feel to earn more is a type of gender discrimination against me. Now, what else is happening to our boys? See if you can pick up the hint in the following sentence. Tests by the Program for International Student Assessment find boys falling behind girls in almost every academic area 
and more than 60 of the largest developed nations. I tried to say developed nations slowly so you'd pick up the hint. Um, de developed nations have in common two things that both affect the boy crisis. First, societal permission for divorce. And second, freedom for women to have children without being married. In the US today, 53% of mothers under 30 who have children are, do so without being married. Now here's the key. The big divide is between the welfare of boys in these two groups who have minimal or no father involvement, what I call dad-deprived boys, versus the welfare of boys whose fathers remain significantly involved, what I call dad-enriched boys. There are more than 70 ways I've found in the research for the boy crisis that boys who are depri dad deprived are in fact deprived. In contrast, boys who are dad enriched do better in school even when they come from four poorer areas with lower ranked schools. They have less ADHD and more empathy. Yes, actually dad involvement leads to an increase in empathy. Dad deprivation, on the other hand, is the greatest predictor of a boy committing suicide or taking drugs. Dad deprived boys are much more likely to drink excessively, be bullies, to drop out of school, to be alienated, to be rudderless. The result, our prisons are centered, our centers for dad-deprived boys. These boys are hurting. When boys who hurt, hurt themselves, as in suicide, we respond with a cultural shrug. But now the boys who hurt are hurting us, we're taking note. Dad deprivation is common to 26 out of 27 of the mass shooters who have killed eight or more people. Ironically, the availability of an AR-15, uh, AR-15, you see how familiar I am with guns, um, with AR-15 style assault weapons is making us more, care more about boys because they make it easier for boys who hurt to hurt us. Dad deprivation doesn't just hurt via mass shootings. ISIS recruits are almost all dad deprived. Not only the boys, but the girls. But involving dads is a lot more complex than people think. For starters, it involves understanding exactly why dad style parenting helps children. Take roughhousing, for example. Although many mothers just see a dad who is roughhousing as one more child she has to sort of mother, <laughs> few dads know that roughhousing helps children distinguish between being assertive versus aggressive, or that roughhousing creates a father-child bond, and it's that bond that reduces the child's resentment when the dad enforces boundaries saying, for example, okay, no more roughhousing until you finish your homework. What's the importance of this boundary enforcement versus boundary setting? Both moms and dads set boundaries. You can't have your ice cream, let's say, until you finish your peas. And kids, and kids test boundaries with both parents. But when the child tries to persuade mom to have the ice cream before she or he finishes the peas, Mom is much more likely to think, I'm not going to waste these few precious moments with my child arguing about a few peas. Dad is more likely to think, and sometimes not even say, but just with his eyes say, you know the deal, finish the peas, then the ice cream, or don't finish the peas, no ice cream. Dad's enforced boundaries re requiring the boy to finish the peas before he gets the ice cream helps his son develop the single most important prerequisite to success, which is postponed gratification. 
A boy without this discipline often slides down a slippery slope, as do many girls without this discipline. The boy can't finish his homework without the discipline of not being able to be distracted by a text or some other interference. He fail, therefore, he fails in school. He receives less respect from friends and teachers. He begins to feel ashamed of himself, becoming depressed, escaping at the end of a needle, or by addiction to video games or porn. In worst case scenarios, he commits suicide, or angry at never being seen at school, shoots the people to whom he was invisible, killing for their attention. Boundary enforcement is just one of many propensities of dad-style parenting that lead to children benefiting far more from dad time than dad's money. One of, the la one of the best ways of integrating dad into the family is via family dinner nights. However, done poorly, family dinner nights can become a family dinner nightmare. <laughs> I found it necessary to develop guidelines for effective family dinner nights. The most important guideline is no electronics at the table during family dinner nights. If you cannot enforce that rule, go back to boundary enforcement. If the children are running the parents, get ready for the family dinner nightmare. What can single moms do? The ideal is to let dad know that you need his distinct parenting style as a check and balance with your own. Men, the key word is need. Men die in war to be needed, to be seen as a warrior. When we tell dads they are needed, father warriors will appear. Now, if you're divorced, there are four must-dos that, must that I've found. If your children, but especially your son, are to have the best possible chance of doing well, as, they would, as well as they would in an intact family, the four must-dos are, one, an equal amount of time with mom and dad. Number two, parents living within about 20 minutes of each other. Number three, no bad-mouthing. Number four, consistent couples counseling. If, in if involving the biological dad is absolutely impossible, here are seven options. Get your son involved in Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, the Y, Boys Club, the Mankind Project, a faith-based community that facilitates all boys support groups, or a young men's ultimate weekend here in San Rafael with Mark Schillinger, who's here with a lot of the boys um, from his group. As for a stepdad, if you're a stepdad or you have a stepdad in your life, the most important thing to know about stepfathering is a stepdad is only as good as the biological mom allows him to be. Stepdads and bio moms need to study how stepdads can be integrated into the family. It never comes naturally. What can schools do? Four starter steps. Actively recruit male teachers for preschool through junior high. A boy going, we now know that a boy going from a female dominated family to a female dominated school is vulnerable to seeking identity from a male gang leader or an ISIS recruiter, as was true with Hitler Youth. Second, reactivate recess. The latest studies show that recess does more to improve grades and the ability to focus than studying. Third, vocational training. In Japan, 99.6% of vocational training graduates are immediately employed. Four, institute organized sports within each school that includes every student and celebrate the, the achievement of these less well-known boys. What is the most pivotal solution on a national level? A White House Council on Boys and Men that addresses the 10 major causes of the boy crisis, integrating consciousness of the boy crisis into our cultural and in the process, saving into our culture and in the process, saving literally, and I calculated it, trillions of dollars on crime, the op opioid crisis, prisons, and our homeland security response
to radical terrorist groups that are the result of the boy crisis. To conclude, when we support our sons, we support our daughters. Women in the workplace relieve the pressure on men to be the sole breadwinner. Dads at home can relieve the pressure on women to be the sole parent. Moms and dads need to know their children benefit far more from dad time than dad's money. We're all in the same family boat. When only one sex wins, both sexes lose. Thank you. Well, there's a lot to think about. Our next speaker, Dr. John Gray, has written books that have been translated into 45 languages and include, and you could probably all say it with me, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, the number one best-selling nonfiction book of the 90s and ranked by USA Today as the sixth most influential book of the last quarter century. He is the co-author with Warren Farrell of the just-released The Boy Crisis. There are some chapters in there about nutrition and ADHD, and it turns out that those were all done by John Gray, who is a nutrition expert. He's on the ketogenic diet, never eats breakfast, and explained to me backstage that on that diet, dopamines are released in the brain that are very similar to what happens when you are newly in love and in the throes of passion. So we'll take a minute for those of you who want to rush home and empty your refrigerator and have a very fun evening. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Gray. I'm so happy to be here. Test. Now, recently my wife was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And yes, I'm diligently working hard at home supporting my wife. In doing so, I've traveled around the world twice looking for treatments that are illegal in America. And in doing so, I had an ear infection and suffered uh, a hernia and <laughs> went into the hospital three weeks ago, and I'm still just recovering. That's called real empathy for your wife's suffering. <laughs> so I might sit down, I usually stand up, but I've been on a walker for the last two weeks, coming back from the extreme vertigo. But my mind works great. When we talk about relationships, I'm reminded by this recent experience in my life of some of the things my wife has said when people ask her, how, how are we doing? And she says, it's amazing. John has risen to the occasion. <laughs> He's my hero. He's right there. I always thought I had risen to the occasion. <laughs> but it's a very important thing about masculinity is to feel needed. I first became aware about, about 30 years ago, teaching classes on men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And a woman, I was explaining this, and a woman stood up and said, that's it, that's it. I said, what? That's why I started having sex again. So we all said, what? Of course, we became very interested. She said, yeah, my husband was like a dead man sitting on the couch all the time, out of work during the Florida Depression. And then a hurricane came, and he happened to be a roofer. And a hurricane came, and the roof came off, and he rose to the occasion. And now he had a job again, of course. And he became a different man. Because for men, one of the biological differences, whether it be male or boys, men or boys, is on a hormonal level, the hormone testosterone is necessary for our well-being. If you're a man, most people don't know this, that if you have a heart attack, we all think of cholesterol as an issue about heart attacks. And yes, cholesterol 50% of the time is an issue. 
When somebody has a heart attack, 50% of the time, their cholesterol is high. But most people don't know that 50% of the time, their heart, their cholesterol is low. So that kind of negates the real uh, statistical significance of that idea. But what is completely clear is that when men have heart attacks, their testosterone levels are low, very low. Well-being, when a man is depressed, his testosterone levels are very low. When a man is lethargic, his testosterone levels are very low. And of course, we know when his libido is gone for his wife, his testosterone levels are low. Ironically, they're not low for the woman he doesn't know. That's an ironic thing, isn't it? I say to men, do you have a problem getting it up? Rising to the occasion. And they say, only with my wife. What is that? Why? It seems paradoxical. And we're going to go right into the boy crisis with this as well, because not in a sexual way, but it's hard for boys to get it up. They're not motivated. They're losing their motivations. Some of the terrible statistics we see. Most universities around the country now have to lower the interest requirements for men to get in. And in terms of graduation statistics, two women to one man graduates. And women come to me all the time, where are the men? I say, you mean the men with college graduates and jobs? And they go, yeah. I say, well, they're not as many. This is a crisis for women as well. And what we're seeing is, well, women have made great advances, and we're really happy about that. We want to look now at how boys are being left behind and what's affecting boys. And I'm going to talk about the neural crisis, a crisis in our brain has to do with dopamine. Why a man loses his interest in his wife but can be interested in a woman online who's undressing her clothes, or a new and different woman that he's never experienced, never been there before? Because new and different stimulates a brain chemical called dopamine. When I met my wife, she was new and different. Produced huge amounts of dopamine just because she's new and different. When you go on a vacation to somewhere you've never been, it's exciting. Why? Because it's new and different. It's novel. Danger also stimulates dopamine. Sugar, spikes in blood sugar, stimulate dopamine. And of course, today we're medicating our children with Ritalin and Adderall and a variety of ADD drugs. What do they do? Stimulate dopamine. So what is this phenomenon of ADD, attention deficit disorder, or hyperactive disorder, ADHD? Most parents say, you know, I don't understand it, attention deficit. My child sitting in front of a computer can go for hours and hours and hours. So there's no attention deficit. It's just the child's not interested in their homework or doing their chores or in what I say or what I'd like them to do. What's going on here? Well, we now know. We didn't know 15 years ago when the New York Times came out and said, Adderall, Ritalin, fantastic drug, improve your performance. And other TED Talks that teenagers show to their parents. Video games improve reaction time, mind-body coordination, mood and behavior, improvements. You can see all those improvements from watching video games because they stimulate high levels of dopamine. You can also play soccer. You can also throw a football. You can also go ahead and be in a competition. You can exercise. You can have a coach. Any of those things will also have those benefits that video games have because they stimulate high levels of dopamine. But when it's real experiences, not new and different fake fantasy, when it's real experiences, there are no side effects. So what are the side effects of hours on the video game. And what can we do to get rid of our children that addiction? Hopefully we'll get to that. Take your child off of video games. No, no cell phone, no video games, no stimulation. And just add to it no TV, which is a moderate, not as high level of dopamine stimulation. And they're going to see the symptoms of a drug addict going off their drug. They're going to cry, they're going to be upset, they're going to hate you, they're going to storm into their room, I can't stand you. They're going to be miserable, they're going to do whatever they can to 
intimidate you so you'll give them back their toy. It's hard. What to do when you've got a little drug addict? What to do? Well, the first thing to do is understand what's going on. Understanding is so key, because most parents don't know that when they give their child ADD drugs, they're treating the symptom but making the condition worse. Now, sometimes, I know, I've been around 15 years teaching this stuff. Some people are still doing their Ritalin all the way throughout their life. They say, it changed my life. I said, yeah. And look at the side effects. They just know it had improvements, but they don't see the side effects, like addiction to porn, addiction to work, addiction to sitting in front of a TV set, addiction to arguing and fighting. All these things I just mentioned stimulate high levels of dopamine. When we send our soldiers off to battle, that's fight or flight. When they're in that state, high levels of dopamine and adrenaline get produced. When they come back, ironically, they're happy to be back, and then they become what? Extremely bored. They want to race their motorcycles. They want promiscuous sex. They want to fight and get in arguments, and they want to go back. Because even though in flight, they're in fight or flight, and they're in danger and sacrifice, because sacrifice also stimulates testosterone, which then can raise dopamine, at least they feel good. They feel alive as opposed to dead. And our children are looking to feel alive. Well, when I was growing up, what made me feel alive? What most of you felt alive is when your parents were proud of you. Even today, when some award happens or something good happens, I get a little teary-eyed. My parents aren't here. I'd like to, them to see that. We are that way. Not their generation. Maybe a little bit. See, what happens to understand this neural crisis? The brain functions. When you experience a high dopamine stimulator, it's like looking into a bright light, the sun. Now, if I keep looking into that bright light, and I look down at you, I can't see you because my pupils constrict, right? And then everything's become dark, and then gradually in the darkness, they begin to open up again, and I can see you. Maybe you've been to a movie theater, it was really dark, and you went out and the brightness would just flood because your pupils opened up so much and the low stimulation, then high stimulation is a huge shock. Same thing, if you have low stimulation, say you're relaxing, maybe meditating, feeling peaceful, which by the way, when you have ADD, you don't know what peaceful is. I sit and relax and look at the view, watch the sunset, go for a walk. I feel peace. They don't feel peace. They feel bored. They don't have the brain function, enough dopamine to experience pleasure when they're not getting high stimulation. So all it takes is a few hours. Well, let's just take the most extreme example, which we have lots of research on. A little bit of cocaine. Which, by the way, Ritalin is just works with the same pathways as cocaine. Adderall works with the same pathways as Adderall. You're just giving your children low-dose drugs. And they are illegal, by the way. They're selling them at universities. Over half the kids at universities are using them all for studying. Some of you might have used speed. Yeah, it makes your brain work better and whatever. Of course, you know, you want to write a book, just take a bunch of speed. You can't stop talking. <laughs> Hollywood is filled with writers. They all take speed. And now Redland and Adderall. That's what gets them going. And you go, wow, your child's going to be so productive. But what's the side effect? And can you be that productive without the speed? Which a lot of drug addicts, once they get off of it, realize they can. I could be totally effective without, effective without the speed. But it's so easy to get to that place with high stimulation. So take a drug. That drug stimulates high levels of dopamine, like the sunshine. And in your brain, you have little, millions of little dopamine receptors, and they just close down like little flowers. They close down. And now you don't feel the symptoms of dopamine. What are the symptoms of dopamine? Well mapped out. Pleasure. Anything that gives you pleasure makes dopamine. 
Just think about that. Anything that gives you pleasure gives you dopamine. More dopamine, more pleasure. So naturally, you're going to be motivated to go towards those things that give you pleasure. So dopamine is the motivation brain chemical, the pleasure brain chemical. Now, if something's giving me a lot of pleasure, what do I do? I go, wow, I'm just looking at that. I'm not looking at you. Try talking to somebody when they're playing a video game. Mothers will go, look at me, look at me, turn that off. He can't hear a thing. His brain is totally focused. Why would he look at you? You're not pleasure. <laughs> you want to take him away from pleasure. So what happens is there's a little addiction to high dopamine stimulation, and that is the definition of addiction. It's what every addictive substance is, is a high dopamine stimulator. And most people don't realize the reason it's such a problem is not that you have to keep taking drugs, People are doing the heroin, they feel great, they can function fantastic on heroin. It's just that they depend on that and have to take more and more just to feel normal. They not even get the high after a while, and then it tears their body up, changes their brain. So as soon as you take cocaine, for example, a spike of dopamine happens in your brain, and your brain says, that's it. And in one use, your brain will redirect it and redirect itself, rewire itself to prioritize cocaine over anything else, over my mother's love, over my acceptance by society, over my desire to help people to make me happy. That's self-generated happiness, is when you're doing something to be of service to others. And every child comes out only wanting to serve you and make you happy until you give them ice cream. And then suddenly they have ice cream. They go, what? Who cares about your dopamine level? It's this much. Ice cream triples it. The brain rewires itself and says, I would rather have ice cream than please my mother. So now what we have is all these wonderful parenting techniques, which is now if you eat your vegetables, then you get dessert. That's what motivates our children. Dopamine gives us... Pleasure, motivation, focus, and interest. So my talk's very interesting. If I say something new and different you didn't know, then it's going to be very interesting. Anything which is new and different is interesting. Oh, curious, huh? Curious. You know, they say all the geniuses in the world, all the very successful people who have influenced the world, one of the qualities that exists in all of them is curiosity. Always being curious. Why? What? Where? You? All that. That's because you're looking. That's self-generated dopamine, as opposed to somebody doing it all for you. Just sit in front of a TV show and a movie. Watch a movie from the 1930s. When I was at UCLA, I took a film class, and they had all these early shows, black and white. They're so slow, you're bored to death. Back, back then, everybody was like, wow, never seen that before. New and different. So what we have to realize is the boy crisis today is primarily based upon the breakdown of the relationship between boy and mother and boy and father. And we need to be motivated as children, particularly boys who are twice as vulnerable to ADD as girls. Twice as vulnerable. And when it comes to autism, five times more vulnerable. We are so vulnerable, and it's making that motivation to connect with our fathers, who we don't see that much anyway. That stimulates dopamine in a boy's brain, my father being proud of me. My mother's unconditional love stimulates serotonin. Both those factors are all necessary for healthy brain function. So to heal this condition, we need to take away the high stimulants, slowly but surely. How, one, one practical tip, we got all books written on these kind of things but the natural solutions that have proven to be more effective than taking these drugs. A hot bath at 102 degrees will take away autism symptoms to a great extent just one time and every other day do it and symptoms start going away. Who knew that? 102, 103 degrees. One of the number one causes of ADHD, statistically 500% greater chance of ADD if a mother takes Tylenol during pregnancy. The drugs are toxic. This is all getting in the way of the body's healthy functioning for optimal brain function. Things we can do is better food, of course, more hot baths is another practical thing, but I did mention I get to one practical solution, <laughs> other than understanding the problem and looking for the natural solutions that exist. Research shows that vitamin C, omega-3, and grape seed extract, which increases the potency of vitamin C, actually will in days improve a child's focus and comprehension. 
without the drugs. People say, I've tried everything. No, they haven't. I've never heard anybody try any of these natural solutions. And there's hundreds of studies to back it up. But here's something you can start today when you start limiting the time your child spends on the telephone, or the video games here, and all that extra stimulation, or the computer. You just say, we're going to start breaking this down half. And then when they get upset, it's, like, then it's going to go down further. <laughs> and let them be upset. But when they're on the video game, have them take one of these. These are dates. <laughs> now, if you read any of my other books, you know I'm a big fan of oxytocin. Oxytocin is hugging and touching. It's the thing that children don't get when their dopamine levels are being overstimulated. Oxytocin will calm it down. It will keep them from being so addicted. Hugs, affection, understanding, empathy, biologically, dates. If you want a great romantic date, give her three dates before you go. <laughs> if you want more testosterone, make sure there's almonds with it. Almonds and dates. Put them around the house. Put them in front of the computer. <laughs> it's sweet. It's a gift. Thank you all so very much. Okay. So our third speaker, Ashanti Branch, was raised by a single mother in Oakland. He's the founder and executive director of Ever Forward, Siempre Adelante. From a civil engineer working on building great buildings to a math teacher supporting students to build their belief in themselves to an administrator helping teachers build capacity to engage, inspire, and insport their students, Ashante now travels around the world using all that he has learned to train young people and adults social emotional tools to better collaborate to create healthy learning environments for everyone. Now, this is spring break, and we see lots of pictures of drunken college students cavorting on the beaches. Doesn't really make us proud. Ashante Branch is probably the only person I have ever met who had five jobs to put himself through college and never took one drink. So please, join me in welcoming Ashante Branch. So I normally don't stand behind these things, um, but I have some notes. But um, I'm going to start out here for a second. So, um, you know, what would you do if someone told you that they thought about hurting themselves? Like, just imagine, like, if someone today had called you or texted you and said that they were thinking about hurting themselves, what would you do? Like, who would you call? What would you say? How do you talk someone off of that proverbial ledge from afar? Today, at about 12 o'clock this afternoon, um, I got a text from a young man. And I've been checking in on him since yesterday. So I'll give you some context. So the Ever Forward Club, we take young people on a college tour every year. This is our 13th year to go visit colleges in Southern California, to go see places that they could be if they just had a little bit more belief in themselves, if we pushed them hard enough to say, look, you can do it too. And so we had these young men out in San Diego for the first time. We usually go to Los Angeles, but this time we ventured past and we went down to San Diego. And our young men were going through it. Like the challenges that we see happening on our daily day streets in here in Oakland and the Bay Area, we saw our young men dealing with this battle on this very nice bus, on a very nice trip, in a very nice city, the same stuff was coming up. I mean, I had students having philosophical discussions on a physical level. You know what that means? Like they were fighting. I mean, I had students that walked into certain um, establishments and um, decided that the things that they wanted, they wanted, but they didn't want to make an exchange for them. 
This is what happened over the last five days. So we got back yesterday, and one of the young men, I had to call his, uh, his mom. And it was a hard call, and we, we worked through it. And so we sent him off home, and I got home around 6, and I texted him. I said, hey, how's everything going? He didn't respond. Did you make it home safely? No response. Hey, I just got to Oakland. I got to my house. Where are you? No response. Today, 11 o'clock a.m., did you make it home safely? Yeah, I did. Thanks for checking. How are things with your mom? I don't know. I'm staying at a, my house at the moment. Oh, says, I don't know. I'm not staying at my house at the moment, and I don't think I'm going to court. Where are you staying? I can't talk right now, but I'm here and there. Why didn't you go home? I'm preparing for a talk, and I, I need your help on something. I wanted to just get his attention. I was trying to figure out where he was at. He says, I did go home, and my mom's talk, and it didn't go well, so really, what do you need help with? Okay, so I got him engaged. Okay, good. Write me a couple of sentences about what you're feeling right now, because I'm talking about what young men feel, right? So I need, I'm engaging him. And about what happened when you went home. He says, sure, I'll do my best. Right now, I'm feeling alone and afraid about my future. I'm worried about what I'm capable of now that I feel isolated. Suicide is often crossing my head time to time. I just hope I'm going to have a strength to move forward and see better days. Then he texts, the next text says, I hope that's enough. I'm like, no, we're not finished. We're not, I, I thought it was gonna be something simple that I was gonna be able to read to you. And that's not simple. And so then I say, well, well you're too special to commit suicide. You're a valuable young man. We're going to get through this. I'm on your team. Tell me more. Like, I'm trying to just, he's far away. I'm, I'm here. Like what? I'm at a loss for words. And then he texted me an email. Let me tell you what the email said. Dear student, sorry to take so long to respond. You were great on stage, and I was glad to hear your story. I would be happy to see how we can get you to share your story further. Are you interested in coming to speak to students at my school? Or are you interested in other ways? Like this young man who was at this moment of like, I'm ready to end it because I'm going through all these problems, gets an email <laughs> miraculously from some teacher who saw him on stage with me who says, I need you. Like, I need you to be here because your story needs to save someone else. Like, that's what our young men are going through in different ways. It doesn't always look like them saying, I'm going to commit suicide. It may just be a rampant use of unhealthy drugs. It may be a eating. It may be many different ways that it shows up. But I'm going to tell you a little bit more. So now I'm going to come back over here because I need you to see this a little bit more. So the Ever Forward Club was started in 2004. I was not trying to start a nonprofit. I was a first year teacher and I was failing. Like I had left an engineering career to become a teacher because I wanted to give back to my community and I had these young men in my class that were super smart but were failing. And I was like, you know, I'm not waiting around to get good at teaching for you to have success. Like we're gonna figure this out. So I invited some young men to lunch. I said, look, I'll buy you lunch once a week. In exchange for lunch, teach me how to be a better teacher. Like, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. It was always about asking them what I needed and what I wanted to know because I don't have the answers. I tried everything I knew. And all the teaching I had learned and all the skills I had learned in youth development was not working with these young men that were in my class. And that's how the Ever Forward Club was started. Ten years later, we were invited to be a part of a documentary called The Mask You Live In. The Mask You Live In is a narrative of American masculinity and how this hyper-masculine narrative is failing our boys. And so after that documentary came out in 2015, we began to do more work around the masks, asking people all over the world to make a mask. Like, what do you show people? I'm, I'm going to let a young man explain to you what the mask is. This is his definition. When people wear masks, they make it appear that they have it all figured out. If a person sees others wearing masks, they don't feel like they have the strength to take off their own mask. That's a high school student. He goes on to say, I think I'm doing a better job of revealing my true self. I feel like I found a small circle of real friends that I can be open and honest with. I still have some work to do, but I'm on my way. I think about your mask. I think about what is it that you let the world see about you? What are the qualities and characteristics that you gladly invite people to see about you? Now think about the other ones. Think about the ones that you don't talk about, that people bring it up, you ignore it, you change the subject. Like they send you a message about it, you're like, I don't want to talk about it. 
And imagine what our young people do. We've had a lot of practice as adults. We had a lot of practice of getting people off of us when they're in our business. So we're like, I'm changing the subject, or I'm deleting that text, or whatever we're going to do, we're going to make sure that they don't get too deep. But what do our young people do when we're smothering them with questions? What is this? What is that? Where are you going here? What is and then they're trying to figure it out. So they're learning of like, oh, I got to put this little mask on. I got to show that everything is good so that people stop bothering me because if I tell them something's wrong, they're going to start asking me more questions. I'm going to read a few masks to you just so that you can get a context of what young people are saying. These young men are saying on their masks. And one of them is from here, like at this campus. Like I'm bringing some of Dominican here into the room so you can feel something from here. This young man is 20, in front of the mask, poised, confident, easygoing, the back of the mask, my past, sensitivity, weaknesses, religious, religiousness, things he doesn't talk about. Now I'm going to go a little younger, so some younger people, front of the mask, funny, always smiling, never mad. The back of the mask, mad a lot. Always sad, fear, anxiety. That's a middle schooler. This one says, front of the mask, funny, cool, smart. Yeah, that's great. Back of the mask, family problems, fear, sadness. Doesn't get to talk about it. So we can go over mask. I can show you mask after mask after mask. You're going to see similar patterns. Like there's this part of themselves that they know that they can show, and there's another part that they can't show because we are not allowed to feel. Men are not allowed to feel. And there's a narrative. Maybe in your house it's okay to feel. Maybe you allow your children and your young people, the young men, to have full feeling, emotion, or range. But when they walk out that door, depending on where they are, there's a narrative about how they have to show up. We asked these young men that were on this college trip about like commitments that they wanted to make. So how do I, what commitment do you want to make to make a difference in your life? Like you know that you're wearing a mask, but what commitment are you going to make to do something different? I'm going to tell you about a few commitments they made. My commitment for my life and for the changes I need to make are that I will put 100% effort into my studies so that I can get the best grades possible. I also need to be nicer to my family. This other one said, participate, raise my hand, don't procrastinate, no side talking, one mic, sit next to people I can focus with, watch my temper. I made a commitment to get a 3.0 at the end of this marking period. The commitment I made was to clean up my act and start making smart decisions. The last one. What I need to do from life was to stop being lazy and to take a risk to be successful in life. This is by asking young men, what commitment do you make to making your life better? And we believe that the more that we begin to ask young people, what is it you're up against? Without judging, without projecting our stuff on them, without, when I say our, I mean ours as mentors and the work we do in Ever Forward, we provide a space for young people to talk about the stuff that goes on in their life in a healthy way. Now, I'm, I'm going to give some data for people who like numbers. I'm, I'm not going to give a lot of data, but I'm going to give a little bit of data, okay? So here's a little bit of data for you. At one school, this school was all boys, um, we asked them to do the mask. And so we crunched a little bit of the numbers, and I'm going to just tell you a few numbers. Here we go. Out of 919 boys, young men, middle high school, this is high school, on the front of the mask, 30% of them said, I show them funny. 30%. 33% had a combination of kind, caring, and nice. 16% said happy, 14% said smart. Okay? And there's a bunch of other numbers and we're just gonna not go too deep, okay? Now, on the back of the mask for this group in particular, like, they were very spread out. Like, the numbers were really spread out because there's a lot more words they began to use on the back, a lot more words that they began to talk about of things they don't talk about. So I'm gonna just tell you the top three in percentages and I'm gonna read you a list of them. Top three, 9% anger. Family issues, 8%, 7% fear. And the ones following that are sad, shy, feelings, depression, scared. Okay, that's one school. We'll go to one more school, and then just so you can get a, a very, this is the one in East Bay, one in, um, one in the San Francisco Marin Bay, whatever you want to call it, right? So what, that's the other bay. I don't know what you call it. <laughs> whatever they call it. Whatever they call it. You, 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 you get it. Okay, so this one, 
This is the front of the mask, the front, all right? Um, this one's interesting. So this one, 49%, 49%, almost half of them said, I'm happy. I show the world that I'm happy. 33% said funny, and 9% said confident, okay? And then on the back, this is the back of the mask, 18% sadness, 14% stressed, 13% anger, 11% sad, and then the words after that are tired, fear, depression, anxious, lonely, anxiety. So these are our young men. When we provide a space for them to speak and not interrupt them and not tell them that they're not feeling what they're feeling, they'll tell us. And when we take them through our workshop called Taking Off the Mask, young people will come out of there realizing that they hadn't ever experienced something so deep. So here's what we hear them say at the end of a workshop. I found this activity to be not only helpful, but eye-opening as well. The activity brought me to a place I've never been before, a happy place. I reached this state because I could experience honesty and it allowed it to be held in confidentiality. The next young man. I like that I know and can understand how other guys are feeling, and they have feelings too, and that we can be open with each other. It's also cool to know that the guys I consider tough or cool have issues too. I really like this. The last one from this one workshop. I feel I can relate to more of my classmates now after these activities. I no longer feel like I'm the only one with feelings. I now feel closer to my classmates with hardships. That's one school. Here's another school. This made me feel good because I got to talk about my problems. I felt relieved to share things I've never felt brave enough to say. This was very good. I had a time to relax and think and feel safe. This was a nice experience. And this last one that I'm going to spend a little time on says, I think this experience was a good chance to let feelings out. Like our young men are clear that they have to have a special place to let feelings out. Because letting feelings out in other settings is not safe. What would cause someone to believe that they're not safe to talk about how they feel? Well, if you believe that talking about how you feel made you look weak or soft, or many other words that you may not like but that you probably have heard before, you may totally keep all those feelings in. And imagine keeping all those feelings in all the time. Imagine being a bottle shaking up, shaking up, shaking up, just building up pressure like a pressure cooker. Imagine opening the pressure cooker before you release the pressure. Ever tried that? It doesn't look good. We have an opportunity to think about that in a bigger way. What our young men are feeling, sometimes we just need to ask. And then we need to close our mouths and listen. Because what we've seen it ever forward is as soon as you ask them and you give them a space to do it, and they know that you're not gonna judge them They'll tell you. Thank you very much. Well, one of the things that I really love about the book that we're talking about tonight is that it has so many answers. And this is our opportunity to ask the questions and get some of the answers. My copy of the book is full of uh, pages and markers and yellow and different colors. So I've learned a ton, and we're going to learn some more. Why do you believe that the mass shooters are generally young white males? Warren, you want to take that? Sure, I'll, start, I'll start out. Um, y uh, young males are the, um, almost, as you, as you heard, they're almost all dad-deprived. And I think when there's that lack of boundary enforcement, there's that slippery slope that goes down to making um, males feel like they, they are not worth anything because they aren't completing their homework, they're not completing, um, they're, even if they're, they have aspirations of, you know, they're, they're six foot eight and they have aspirations of becoming an NBA player, they can't complete the drills. They can't, so the bigger the dream is at home, the greater the disappointment is in reality. 
And so that starts leading them into depression and really a shame-based um, experience that, um, and when nobody is paying attention to you at school and you feel like you have no respect from girls, no respect from male peers, no respect from teachers, the resentment and the seething anger that can build in so many boys, for, uh, boys mostly for, for doing that, and then the availability of guns being so easy in the United States in particular, um, that combination creates a, um, a set of problems. Now, the white boy um, dimension of it, um, white boys, this is the way they express their anger. African-American boys express, kill each other. They're far more likely to kill in people that they know, other black boys. Um, Hispanic boys tend to join gangs to a greater degree. So there's a sort of cultural zeitgeist that sort of like leads different types of um, backgrounds, ethnicities to different types of ways of expressing their anger. But inside of all of them is that deep hurt. And I, I hope that what we really get maybe from what a little bit of what I said is that um, um, anger and shooting is a mask for vulnerability. And when we approach these boys seeing the vulnerability first, I think we take the first correct step towards solving the problem. I'm curious, that makes sense to me. Ashante, did that resonate with you, the difference between uh, why most of the mass shooters are white males? Yeah, I don't think I have a good answer for that. Um, I think uh, the answer resonates really well with what Warren said. Um, I think what I do understand about our, our young men in, in different schools, in different settings, is that there's this bottled up aggression and emotion. And so I know that what, we, what we've seen in just some of our work is that um, there is a need for them to talk it out and they don't have a space to talk it out. And so we see that that similar language that we are used in whether we're in um, a very urban school or we're in an independent school of the same idea that um, the feeling of not being seen, a feeling of not being heard, of being isolated and being lonely, and, those, and the results of those show up in so many different ways. So that, that's, that's the best I can do on that. Okay, Tim, next question. Great, thank you. Um, got a question here about the impact that the Me Too movement is having on this issue. And other than exposing abusive behavior, um, what can women do in a societal sense to play a role in helping men to change these behaviors? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that I don't think there's anyone that I've ever met that isn't really happy that women are speaking up about their feelings and what's hurting them. Um, to answer the question, what can be done about it? I'd say it is to begin to look at the Me Too movement as have it being the first of about five stages. Uh, one of those stages is, is giving um, permission for boys to speak up about their reality and their experience. Um, my experience with working with boys and girls is that they have enormously different ways of looking at their fears of rejection. And so as we start to um, understand both of them, I think both will be uh, very different. Um, the uh, second, um, getting boys, if, if you said what can women do? So the single most important thing that we can do as parents and teachers is to encourage our daughters to share responsibility for taking the risks of rejection. Our daughters are by and large the more mature sex in school. To ask the less mature sex to be the one to have, to take sexual risks by expectation <coughs> and the more mature sex to be able to only have to take risks by option, that's not treating women equally. It's also not training women to take risks. The, the risk takers who have created almost all the, the, the huge businesses, the Gates the, um, and all the other uh, major companies that have started, those are not companies that have promoted people up the ladder more because they're males. Those are almost all companies that started out of garages where men were, took risks that for each one that we hear about, there are hundreds that failed. And so if we want our daughters to be an equal number of the CEOs of their own companies, we need to start by training our daughters to take risks in their most 
vulnerable area of life about the, mo their mo the most vulnerable thing in their life, and that is sexuality. When, when, we can, when women and girls can deal with those risks, we will be serving our daughters better, and we won't just be telling boys, you take the risks. When you do it too quickly, too, too fast, you're, uh, you're an oppressor. When you don't do it quickly enough, nobody will even notice you. Okay, ladies, before we leave tonight, you have to ask somebody out. <laughs> just to see what it feels like. John, Mars and Venus, where do they weigh in on this? I forgot the question. <laughs> Tim, the question again. It's about the Me Too movement and, and oh. ways in which women can help play a role in, in helping men change these behaviors. I think the problem's been around a long time. Uh, this is the age-old story of men use power for sex and women use sex for power. It's been around always. It's still there. And we're growing up. We're going beyond that. And this is... Warren talks about in various stages. This is the first stage. Everything goes back and forth. And, you know, I read all the stories of the women who've been abused by well, the Hollywood producer, and some were real abuse. Others were, I found myself in his bedroom. He was in, he went to the bathroom, came out naked in a robe with an erection. Well, what do you expect? This is Harvey Wine, whatever his name is. He's notorious. Now, I, I work down in Hollywood. I don't know how many people do, but it's very standard there to have sex to get ahead. Every starlet hopes to go to Hollywood if you've got a body that says sex for sale. And he goes, yeah, let's see. You get the job. So there's two sides of this thing. And Harvey, in defense, you know, he's an old guy. <laughs> He says, nobody else says that, because <laughs> nobody else says that. And, 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 you know, it's a problem that has to be dealt with where sex is used that way and men use power that way. The problem has to come out, as Warren would put up, point out, which I'm right in harmony with. The way we're doing it right now is a shaming message to boys. It's a shaming message. It's coming across, men are bad, men are rapists, men are no good. Harvey's not a rapist, he's an asshole. <laughs> Everybody knows that in Hollywood. He's a rich asshole. And there's no question about it. Even a joke at the Academy Awards long before this happened, right on the stage before the whole world, oh, another starlet having to pretend to be turned on to Harvey. That's the reality. That's their world. And they make a lot of our movies. And I think our movies are constantly misleading us throwing women's sex around all the time, all the round. So a woman's low self-esteem goes, okay, if I don't feel worthy inside, if my father ignored me and I feel neglected, I got a pretty body, I'll use that to get daddy's attention to the next man that's not available. And so we have all this crazy impersonal sex going around and nobody can sustain relationships. When I say nobody, I'm exaggerating, of course. But I'm, I'm right there in the dating scene. I'm right there with all the people and their problems. There's twice as many single people now in relationship to the population as were 30 years ago. We're going marriages downhill. Why? We come back to this basic, I'll come back to my basic talk on the ADD phenomena. Inhibited dopamine function means I need new and different to feel alive. And once you're no longer new and different, you're boring. I like you. I wish you well. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. And we can say, oh, sex is not that important, but give me a break. Do you go out and marry somebody you're not sexually turned on to? No, that's the first requirement for a man. You need to feel some arousal. Hey, this girl could be great in bed. That's what goes on inside of every man. And what's the problem with that? You know that, women. That's why you dress that way. Come on, let's bring it out. Sex is a beautiful thing, and it needs to be balanced with love. And it used to have a lot more love with it than it does today. Now, I'll bring it back to the problem I talked about, because I see this as the crux underneath all of this. I appreciate all this social stuff and everything, too. Father deprivement is a huge thing for boys. It's one of the major causes of ADD, if not contributes to it. But a big problem is our diet. We're feeding our kids processed food and junk food, and that raises their blood sugar levels up. Two-thirds of the youth are going to be diabetic when they get older. 
This is like, this is blood sugar issues. Blood sugar issues basically means hormonal dysregulation. This means low testosterone in males. Your average man today in this room, and it will change and get worse in the next generation, over 50 has half the testosterone levels of a young man. I'm sitting here at 66 with 50% more because I have a good diet. It's not extreme. I did mention it in intro. I don't eat breakfast. I have, <laughs> I have a cup of tea, several cups of tea with a... Uh, MCT oil in it, great thing for the ketogenic diet. There's two sources of fuel, sugar, which is a dopamine spiker, or fat, healthy fats. We need to learn about ketogenic diets. We need to learn about taking our kids off of junk food, and we need to learn about hot baths. I want to emphasize that again. <laughs> hot baths, and I didn't tell you that a hot bath needs 10 pounds of magnesium. These kids are hyper, hyper distracted, hypersensitive, all this drama and violence and everything. It's hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity. I was ADD. I fell out of a tree when I was a kid, got ADD. I don't have it anymore. I healed it. But I went from, here's the stages. Somebody's in front of me in a car. Somebody pulls in front and they're going slow. What's my reaction? I hate you. Who are you? And you drive by and you look at them. We all do it. That's... that's what ADD does extremes, I'm frustrated, i got to pass this person, who is it, as opposed to I hate you. See, that's what this ADD phenomenon does. It's intensifying everything, more drama, more addiction, more non-loving sex. You see, loving sex doesn't stimulate the high levels of dopamine. If we're addicted to high levels of dopamine, then we can't have sex with the people we love. Then the family unit breaks apart. So many people say, yeah, we love each other, we wish each other well. Well, what happened underneath that? President Gore loves his wife, Tipper. We all saw him kiss, like two statues. <laughs> and then they get a divorce. Why? Because he's a man. He's not getting it at home. He's not turned on to his wife. He loves her, which stimulates estrogen, lowers his testosterone. He doesn't have that dopamine or newness to raise it back up. And so his young assistant, wow, I feel like a man again. So we need to really understand our food, our environment is toxic, and we need to be aware of all those conditions and make adjustments so that we can maintain our youthfulness, our vitality, and our children can mature. And as you mentioned, boys are, some boys are taking two years longer to hit puberty. They have so much estrogen in their body. They're, and estrogen creates anger. Estrogen creates fear. Everything behind that mask is actually hormonal imbalance. Whenever you're angry, you're not testosterone. Most people have that backwards. You didn't know that before. Testosterone turns to estrogen, and that creates violence and anger in men. I'm talking too much time. <laughs> we're we're going to move on just a little bit. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. We have a lot more questions we want to get through from the audience, so uh, we'll just continue to move on. Oh, Ashanti, well, I'm sorry. You Did you want to... Tim, before yep. you do that, I was just trying to do the math and think about what I listened, what I heard, and I heard that you had 50% more testosterone than most men your age. I think there's going to be a line to ask you out for dinner at the end of this. <laughs> I think I just wanted to add um, around uh, the Me Too movement and what we're seeing with a lot of our young men, um, and I think a lot of the things that both John and Warren spoke to is um, we need to help our young men who um, in many ways are living in a world where they have access to um, abundance of pornography that is causing their brains to be rewired. Like our young men, um, the, the, the velocity at which you can load pages now on the internet allows them to watch multiple tabs of multiple things and they think that foreplay is the finishing. And so if you have not learned then you think that what turns women on and what makes them excited is these kind of behaviors, then it will be very difficult for you to approach a young woman and know what it means to court them. Because all you're looking for is all you're looking is to, to finish. And so what's happening is that not only biologically is it causing trouble for our young men, is that it is doing something to their relationship, ability to relate with someone else. So it's like, I'm at a party, I'm supposed to get something, and if I'm not getting something, then it's your, something wrong with you. I think that's one thing that we see with a lot of our young men. Another thing we see with a lot of our young men is understanding that this gray zone that gets really dangerous. So when I was in high school, I could, 
I was told by people because I didn't have a father in my house that you know walking around, walking and touching a girl in her butt was 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 what you do. That's, that's what they said. It's just that's how you get your attention. You touch her, you touch her butt, and then she'll say, "No, don't do that," or she'll or she'll be like, "Hey, hey, what's up?" <laughs> now. I didn't, I, I, maybe if you like, had me sit down and think and process that, do, should you do that? I would be saying, no, I should not do that. But that's what people around me did, and that's, it worked. Like, you would see a dude walk by, he'd hit, he'd touch, he'd grab, you know, and then they'd be like, whoa, it worked. How'd that work? But because it, it was so many things going on that is not okay, it's not okay but it was in certain, it's acceptable in most communities, and it's not okay. So what happens when you're teaching these younger boys, and they're learning from 17-year-olds, here's how you do it. The 17 year olds are teaching the 12 year olds, and so you can imagine it's a recipe for disaster. And if you are thinking that that's the way you do it, and that's the way you get attention, and that's the way you get them to like you, then you may be doing all the wrong things not knowing. Not knowing if you really thought about it, but knowing that it's working for everyone else around you. So maybe that's how I'm supposed to behave. And I think that those are some dangerous areas. And for our young men who we see in our communities, we, you know, we have a lot of young women who grew up without their fathers as well. And so this idea that they are looking for someone. Now, in our community, I'm in Oakland, so we see a lot of underage, we see a lot of prostitution, we see a lot of sex trafficking, and we have, unfortunately, they have a lot of girls who are looking for this man to love them and care for them because they didn't have it. Our boys look for it, too, and we look for it in a lot of different ways. And we got to begin, like, figuring a way to begin supporting our, our young people and, and helping them find the love they're looking for in really healthy ways. Because there's some people out there who are willing to give it to them in unhealthy ways. And that's something I want to say about that. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, Tim. All right, thank you. Um, another question. We often hear the phrase, boys will be boys. And yet this thinking prevents us from understanding why boys learn that aggression and power leads to social success and acceptance. How do we address this kind of thinking? No one wants to take that. Everyone wants to take that. Okay, so Warren. I think we start by acknowledging the positive aspects of what boys are about. So we don't go right to the toxicity of masculinity. Uh, we understand first that heroic intelligence is socialization for a short life. Health intelligence is socialization for a long life. We have historically always trained our sons for socialization for a short life, to be heroes. We called them, we called them heroes if they went to war and they died. They knew that the more that, that, that they're more elite their status of entering the possibilities of death, like being a Navy SEAL, will make them more, that make their parents more proud, make people talk about them at school. They'll go back to the 50th year re reunion, be able to say, I'm a Navy SEAL. And, but it was, pre it was preparation for our sons to be disposable. Um, and and in, in work, the dying at the desk is what the Japanese call karoshi. It literally means dying at the desk, desk or dying from overwork. If you are really successful and you're a salary man in J Japanese terms, but if your women are gonna be interested in you, you have to succeed by being willing to take risks to be able to, um, to produce a great deal of money to be loved. And so boys learn that taking risks, being willing to get rid of their own life if necessary will bring them more love. We practice this at every school called football. As the cheerleaders go first and 10, do it again. Not first and 10, please refrain and be careful. Uh, <laughs> the, and so the boys, the boys are constantly learning, when I get resistance, I need to figure out a way around the resistance. When I get a no, the people who succeeded, the Harvey Weinsteins did not stop because th at the first no. They found a way around every no. So we have to sort of look at what are the messages that we're sending that we're telling our sons, these are things you do to be loved by girls and by women, and then these are the, not the things you do to be loved. We have to start getting these messages clear and seeing the contradictions and the messages we're, we're sending to get a boy loved and also to get a boy 
feeling ashamed because he did it the wrong way. And I think that's where the beginning of where we start um, in this process. John? Okay. Uh, I'll try to be more brief. So we have three... three thank you. <laughs> I'll remember that. <laughs> we have three parts of our brain. We have the front part of the brain, executive part of the brain, as prefrontal cortex. And the neurons in that part of the brain, the DNA of them, are the only neurons in our brain that are different from monkeys and lizards. Okay, so many of you already know that, but many don't. So this is when blood flow goes to this part of the brain, you're in control. You do what makes sense, and you're able to remember that, you know, hitting that person last time didn't really work. And if I hit him, he's probably going to want to hit me back. And if I kill him, his neighbor's probably, his brother's going to kind of kill me. That was Gandhi who taught us. An eye for an eye only makes everybody blind. And that's what we're all trying to move beyond. And that's using this part of the brain. So we have this monkey part of the brain, which is like mirrors. If you love me, clap for me. You're the best audience I've ever seen, okay? So I love you. If you don't, then I don't like you anyway. That's how humans are when they're in this part of the brain. And that's a more, very important part of our brain. It's the monkey part of the brain. It's the reactive part of the brain. And from there comes emotions and jealousy, love and affection and hate and anger. All that stuff is in that part of the brain. And then back here, there's the fight or flight. And we're feeling threatened. Oh, my gosh. That's like cold-blooded. And who's in charge in your brain? So when I see, you know, when I see a frappuccino over here, or I see a date over there, and I say, that date's going to give me more fuel and be better for me, help balance my hormones. And I go, yeah, but the frappuccino gives me a big dose of dopamine. Who's in charge in my brain right now? Hmm. The primitive brain. Conditioned response. Conditioned response. So now we come back to what violence is about. I mentioned before that men are only violent when their testosterone is turning into estrogen. It's not testosterone. It's testosterone converting to estrogen. That's now proven. So what we want to do is teach men how to come back to their testosterone side so they have detachment. They're able to disconnect from the monkey brain temporarily and let this part of the brain take control. Now, you can have trained men in this, and what they do in the army, and they'll stand you in front of a line, and they'll abuse you. They verbally abuse you, and you can't give any attitude. You've got to say, yes, sir, yes, sir, you're a loser. Yes, sir, you're a wimp. Yes, sir, you're scum of the planet. Yes, sir. And if you don't say yes, sir, with a clear intent that you didn't upset me at all, give me 50. You're going to do push-ups. You train yourself to contain these reactive motions, these crazy emotions, these violent emotions. I'm going to get you. You suck it up. So you learn to do that. That's part of being a man because when you detach temporarily from your emotions when they're negative, testosterone goes back up and your estrogen goes down. This is what they were training. Now, I don't think everybody has to go through boot camp. I think you just have to get married <laughs> and listen to your wife be upset at you and not get upset back. Can you imagine if all the boys had fathers who did that? There'd never be any aggression in this world. But what happens is when men don't know what to do when their wives are unhappy, then when men go into, I don't know what to do. And when you don't know what to do and you feel threatened... When the person you love more than anybody else in the world is saying you're just a loser, you're feeling threatened, fight or flight, you don't know what to do, then what happens is blood flow stops from the front part of the brain, goes back here, and you lose control. Your testosterone turns into estrogen. You become either extremely anxious and fearful or angry and abusive. And again, even then, the violence is something that we learn, and we learn that by studying monkeys is when monkeys have never seen violence, they don't get violent. It's once they see it, then they learn it. So a lot of our aggression is we learn it, but it only comes into play as a conditioned response if we've witnessed it, we've seen it, and we're out of balance. So one of the keys is training young men how to practice standing at attention, how to detach, how to not always express what you feel, but as you're talking about, which is very important, is creating a safe place where I'm not angry at you, I'm just telling you I'm angry at them. But I'm not angry at you, because if I was to get angry at you and put my face in your face, you're going to be angry back. Nobody can handle that. That's, which is a little tip for women. If you're angry at a man, you're talking to him, don't look him in the eyes. <laughs> He'll just get angry back. The eyes are the window to the soul. You can't pretend to not be angry when you are by looking in somebody's eyes which goes back to the old Greek myth of Medusa. 
you see her look her in the eyes, he turns to stone. How did he cut off the head of Medusa? And if you cut off one complaint, you get three more snakes. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you cut off the head of the witch? You cut off her head, but you do it by looking in your shield. You look at her through a reflection. You look at her from understanding her from another point of view. When we learn to hear other people's point of view, peace will prevail in this world, and it starts at home between man and woman, and that's how we teach our boys. Well. Okay, Tim. Great. Okay, I've uh, got a question here for, I think in particular for our educators, Barbara, you, and Ashanti as well. Uh, what are schools doing well and not doing well in helping with these issues? If there were a couple of education policies you could recommend, what would need to change? Um, I, I, thank, great question, thank you. Um, what are schools doing well? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so as a former teacher for 11 years, as an administrator for three, and as, as now as a person who goes into schools on a regular basis, um, I see that some schools um, know that they need to do something extra. I think some schools know that they can't expect that their students, their young people, young men and young women, and students who may not identify with either of those, um, need support in addition to the academics. If I tell teachers when I do workshops with teachers all the time, if you care more about the subject that you're teaching than the subjects who you're teaching, there's probably gonna be a disconnect. And we have a lot of teachers that are really good. We have a lot of teachers who are really good at their subjects and they have very little human knowledge of connecting. Like they can get and they can give you a script of the compounds of whatever this and that and when you ask them hey I'm having a hard time with blah 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 they're like hey I don't I don't deal with human stuff I just I just teach the subject and we see teachers do that all the time we have we have principals who know that that teacher won't come to this professional development because this is feely stuff and so we have teachers who need to know more and so I think schools are, are good in knowing we have to work on this and they're not so good at actually doing something I think that teach schools are really good at saying, oh, you know what, you can come and do a workshop for our students, but our teachers won't do stuff like that. And so we have a challenge that if the educators who are there on the front lines of dealing with young people who are coming to them every day with their own worlds, they have to have educators who are getting in touch with their own stuff. And so I, I just really believe that we need better professional development for educators. And as a teacher who taught for 11 years, seven years, um, not taught for 11 years, sorry. Um, it feels like, yeah, I don't know what it felt like. It was 11 years, but I'll tell you, the, professional the amount of professional development I went to and I remember, I can, it's probably five, and three of them because they were bad. And we need better professional development, and that's some of the work that we're trying to do is give teachers some tools to be human and have a better emotional intelligence to deal with young people. So. Okay. Uh I think the policy question is huge. I think we have spent the last 30, 35 years cutting out vocational education, which was an enormously successful thing for boys in schools. We have feminized schools to a tremendous extent. And, I think when you read the book, and it talks so much about boys losing their sense of purpose, that's what we find in schools today. They don't know why they're there. They don't make a connection between what they're learning in school and how that's going to affect the rest of their life. They are not motivated and they don't have nearly enough time to get up and move around and do things. And this has been a quest of mine for a long time. The one positive thing I can tell you is that now, for the, all the wrong reasons, some, it's taken 35 years for policymakers particularly, because remember, educators have to do what the policymakers decide we have to do. And because we've spent all this time worrying about test scores and academics and pushing every kid into college whether or not they want to or need to go, 
We have a whole generation of kids who are getting four-year degrees and have no saleable skills but $100,000 in debt. And, be <laughs> and because of that, parents and policymakers are finally looking around and saying, oh, maybe we need to give kids some skills. So what we tend to do in education is we rename things very well. There is no longer vocational education. It's career and technical education. Well, I don't care if you call it ABC. It's the idea that kids actually do things and create things and make things and produce a product and have a skill that somebody is willing to pay them for. So we're finally bringing some of that back, and hallelujah. And I think in elementary school, again, because of the insane obsession with testing, we have reduced the curriculum to literacy and math. That's all we teach. We don't do the science experiments that we used to do. We don't, get, we don't even give the same amount of recess that we used to do. And uh, how many of you have a boy and a girl? Okay, are they different? Yeah. So I only had a girl and I have two granddaughters and all of them were perfectly happy. They could sit and color for a long time and read a book. Boys don't want to do that. Boys want to run around and run in circles and do things so we take away recess and make them sit in school and do more stupid worksheets. So we've got to remember that boys need to move and give them that time. There are simple things we can do. There are, there's an app called Go Noodle, which I would love to get you up all trying, and you'd love it. it it's like a two-minute oxygenation for the brain, but kids get up and they do things, and there's music, and it's fun. We need to bring that kind of thing back into school. And parents have a responsibility too, because one of the reasons vocational education was so decried for so long is that people felt, well, my kid is smart. He doesn't need vocational education. He's going to get a job that uses his intellect. Well, that's really nice, but when you only use your intellect, they outsource it to, to uh, India. And the plumbing is never getting outsourced because when your toilet is stopped up, you're not calling India. Okay, Tim. Okay, and uh, I've been warned that we just have time for two more questions. So uh, first of them here, uh, this question was addressed to Warren. Uh, recently, there was a headline in the Marin IJ that read, San Rafael sixth grader accused of school shooting threat. He was arrested and sent to juvenile hall. Um, what would you do next if this was your child, or if you could counsel this, this child or the family, what would you do? You know, I, was, I would certainly connect him with a lot of good male role models. Um, make sure um, if, if I'm a faith-based parent, I would get him involved in a faith-based group. If I'm not, I would get him involved with the Cub Scouts, have an extraordinary um, uh, um, amount of a good track record of developing boys' character and integrity and loyalty to a much greater degree. Boy Scouts the same way. I consider getting him involved in that. Um, I consider getting him uh, vetting people in the community who are reliable, responsible male mentors, getting him involved with the Boys Club and so on. Um, I'd also like to, uh, I'd also try to work with my school to get the one thing I think needs to be part of our school curriculum that would be the most single helpful thing. I was mentioning before that when we have problems, we usually have divorces, and divorces lead to a lack of father involvement to a large, um, in a large percentage of the time. But the question is, you can't legislate, you, you sh we should not, I don't believe, legislate that there should be fewer divorces. There needs to be better marriages, and so how do we get better marriages? We get it by communication. What's the problem with communication? Our inability to handle personal criticism without becoming, uh, feeling, re uh, feeling defensive. And so the very first thing that we should do before math, before science, before reading even, well maybe after reading, is teaching our sons and our daughters to be able to hear personal criticism without becoming defensive so that they can express their real feelings to people 
um, but without, but the knowing that the person that they're sharing those feelings with have tools to be able to respond by knowing that if they provide a safe environment for those feelings to be expressed, the other person will feel safe in their presence, will feel more like they have somebody they can trust, and they will be, be, feel more respected and have more potential for friendship. This is the development of emotional intelligence that is very crucial for girls, but it's more crucial for boys, because boys, in the, type, in the process of toughing it out, have learned to disconnect from their emotional intelligence. That's the next evolution. The degree to which women earn money is the degree to which they'll be asking for men that they marry to have more emotional intelligence to compensate for the fact that they don't just love for security anymore. Either of you want to add anything? Warren said, it's, Warren said it so wonderfully. I just add one little thought, which is uh, adding on to what Warren just said. What's missing in terms of the purpose void for boys as well is their fathers. What is our purpose for our wives when our wives can make more money than us? What is my purpose for my wife if she has a job and can be completely independent and self-sufficient? What is it that she needs from me that I can offer her? For most men, and clearly for boys, they don't have role models of seeing a father who is needed by a woman, and a woman who can need a man, and trust a man, and look to him for help and support. Well, what do women need men for today? It's a big question for many single women. They say, well, I don't really need a man. It'd be nice to have a guy to go on a date with, have some sex with sometimes, but..." Why do I really need to be bothered by another child to take care of? <laughs> yeah, that's what women say. So what does that reduce a man down to? This is sort of the uh, kind of the, the milieu of awareness today for men. What is my role? Well, we have to define very clearly if, if a woman can make money and a woman has a job and she's independent, what does she need a man for? Well, Maslow explained this in the 30s. He said that when, or 40s, he said that when survival and security is all taken care of, then higher needs emerge. And what are those higher needs? Those higher needs are for intimacy and personal achievement. We all want to find our authentic self and find out what our abilities are and express them. That's a lot of that is women going to their male side and intimacy. Men want more romance and passion and love. And they're not getting it. Their wives are all overwhelmed. What women need today is the help of a man, in simple terms, to come back from her male independent side to her female side. And women have no role model for that. What does that mean? In practical terms, it means how to create romance for men to learn that. It means how women, it's a two-way street, what women can do to encourage that romance, how to respond on a romantic date. Women complain often that men aren't romantic. Well, what about you? On the first date, you were happy just to wait in line for 15 minutes because he was with you. You were happy just because he called. You were jumping up and down <laughs> later on. It's like, why didn't you call? You know, everything changes, and both in men and women, we have to see how we have to contribute to taking each other to a higher level of romantic love, which is what we aspire towards in the beginning and then become sort of burnt out and forget about. But... That's really what brings us together. But more importantly than that, women need men to be good listeners, to provide a kind of empathy and understanding and a safety for women to come forth and cope with the stress of their independent job when they're on their male side. And I speak not just from psychological terms, I speak from biology. Is that women's estrogen levels are crashing. They're having all these hormonal problems. A third of the women are probably taking hormones in this room because you don't know how to make them through your relationship skills. Well, as a therapist, I see it every week. When a woman comes to me and talks about her problems, complains about her husband, guess what happens? She leaves happy. Why? Nothing changed in her life except her hormones changed. When women can share their feelings, their estrogen levels go up. And when your estrogen levels go up, you can be more upset or you can be happier. You can be more fulfilled. It's learning how to identify the new needs that women have from men and for men to learn the skills and how to provide that, not becoming a girlfriend, but learning how a man does it. And we have no role models for that. Wow. Okay. Tim, last question. Okay. Yeah, this is our last question. Uh, it's for Ashanti and Warren. Can you share more about the signs and indicators that parents should be on the lookout for, the more subtle ones? Uh, perhaps by what age that their boys may be on track towards violence or abusive behavior? 
Yeah, that's um, thank you. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that's a great question, and I don't I don't think I have a great answer. Uh, I think the signs. What I see on the side of the educator and the practitioner side of a mentor is um, I'm always asking questions. So I don't. Um, I don't necessarily wait for signs. If I see a young man who's, like I go to schools all over and I see, I'll see a young man at lunch sitting by himself. I'll see a young man walking down the hall looking at the ground. I'll see a young man just walking like it was earphones in, just checked out to the world. And so I purposely bother those people. Like I purposely get up in their face and I'm like, hey, how you doing, good morning. I just shake them out of their, 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 their ability just the people to walk by and not even see them, I think, sometimes. So I think I just ask a lot of questions. And I think with parents, it's hard because when I was a teenager, I didn't want my mom asking me nothing. Like, I just wanted her to leave me alone. Just let me, can I just, be, can I just do me? Can you just do you? You take care of the other people. I'll take care of me, right? Because I always thought I was an adult. So I think, um, and we didn't, we didn't have a relationship where we did a lot of talking. We didn't talk at dinner. It was not like a dinner time. We have long conversations. It was like, I ate over here, you ate over there, everyone did their own thing. So I think it's like engaging them in conversations and, and, have, and begin building a relationship with them where they know they can talk to you and you're not going to blow up. I think young men are clear, and maybe young women as well. Like, if they're going to tell you something and they know that you're going to lose your, you lose your stuff, they're not going to tell you anything anymore because they're like, it's gonna, you're going to make it worse, right? Like if, like if a middle elementary kid knows if he tells his mom this happened at school and you're going to show up at the school and confront the little kid who did that to him, he's not telling you nothing. He's just going to you're going to wait to find out on your own cuz I'm not you might come up to my school embarrassing me. So I think there's really keeping an open relationship where you where young people know they can talk to you and they can and you can hear it and you can help them kind of try and figure it out. They know you're not going to try and go and solve it for them all the time. Sometimes you need to. Sometimes in dangerous situations you may need to. But sometimes parents sometimes want to do it for them. And it gives them, it takes their ability away to kind of help figure out some of their own problems. So in my work and what we do is we just, it's constantly like I'm just looking for signs of like just not being connected. Like just always, you know, checked out, always on the device and never having a conversation. And, I, and I, with the young people I work with, I'm like, we're going to talk. Like, you're going to put that thing away, right? And, if, and we're going to sit here in silence and just stare at each other. We're just going to stare at each other. We're not looking at you in the eyes, right? But I'm going to definitely have a, I'm going to sit next to you, show elbow to elbow, and, 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 and say, what's up? How, how's everything going? And when they say good, what's good? Well, everything's fine. What's well, fine? Because fine is different for everybody. So I'll stop there. Warren, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I... T- totally agree with you, Ashanti. Um, the, the first thing that I think needs to happen is, like when we were talking about the family, when I was talking about family dinner nights before, uh, one of the crucial dimensions of family dinner night is, is that every person gets to tell his or her story without being interrupted, without being judged, with no comment um, uh, made about that. One of the fastest ways to tell whether a boy is going to be likely to um, move into depression is to observe the way he communicates with his male friends versus the way he communicates with you. Um, And if he communicates with you in a much less um, enthusiastic way, it's almost always because you will judge him. His male friends will just sort of like do what covered put downs, do whatever, and you know, just uh, play with each other. Uh, No big thing. But we're always, as parents, trying to say, you know, well, maybe you could do it differently this way, that type of thing. And boys just withdraw. And so if you're looking for the signs of withdrawal, withdrawal into video games, withdrawal into porn, withdrawal into sarcasm, uh, disconnect. Connected and, and learning the, the difference between the way males express depression and the way females express depression. Boys, oftentimes, the depression that we see, we miss the depression in boys because boys do a lot of acting out. So we're telling the boys, you know, don't speed so fast. Don't, um, don't do this dangerous thing. Um, don't, um, you know, criticize somebody in this way. But all this acting out distracts them, distracts us as parents and as teachers from the depression that they're experiencing. And so I ended up having to, find, to do for the um, boy crisis book a 64-question um, inventory just to 
pinpoint uh, what are the types of things you could notice that is the male style of depression as opposed to the female style of depression. And so these, I think, are major ways we need to educate ourselves um, to get boys to express feelings to each other because the beginning of almost all depression is not being able to say who you are, what you are, what you're feeling, and to say things that are politically incorrect um, and that you think that you're gonna, you might get chastised for saying. Okay. Wow. Well, you have been a wonderful audience. I think we've had three remarkable speakers tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Remember, if you have a book or you want to get a book and you'd like to get it signed, uh, John and Warren will be here to sign your books. I hope you have a very safe trip home and be, let's all be good to each other. <laughs>